Welcome, everybody. My name is Dr. Eric Watchorn, as you can see from the slide that's listed below. I am a part of the Mantech group, um, specializing in a little bit of cloud security. And today, we're going to talk about supply chain risk management and how it interacts with cloud security. Um, I'm a new uh, recent join to the Ethical Hacker uh, Council group. I uh, was nominated last year and was able to join. I uh, have been a long time uh, member and, and, and uh, paying attention, uh, first time presenter. So uh, this will be a learning experience for myself and hopefully you guys will enjoy the presentation. And if not, please let me know what I can do to fix it. Uh, things you would like to have included or things you would like to have modified in order to uh, show whatever perspective that you think might be more beneficial for uh, anyone who is interested in it. So as you see here, uh, the slide is uh, self-explanatory. So we're gonna move on to the next one. Um, the basics of cloud security are functional in many, many different ways. Um, I've highlighted what we call the, the basics of cloud security as it pertains to the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Kudos to the hardworking folks over there that have come up with some interesting ways of thinking about cloud, and then we're going to take that knowledge of cloud and we're going to apply it to the supply risk uh, chain management framework. So what is cloud? Uh, as you see right above, uh, cloud is nothing more than a, a fancy way for a computing model, which enables ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand demand network access. And I won't read all these to you because I, I think you guys can read all of them. But we start to see where there are essential characteristics. There are four service models. There are four deployment models. And those things are now beginning to align, if you will, from a security standpoint to the NIST cybersecurity framework and then the cloud security alliance. And we see uh, down at the bottom of the graphics that we're trying to show the different inferences of how the two things interact with each other. However, with a lot of the new updates to the different various instructions and guidelines and some of the need from a cyber standpoint, we're starting to see these integration of these three models together, which is both a, a interesting thing to observe and is actually, in my personal opinion, the, the direction we should be going. So cyber supply chain risk management has multiple elements. And as it applies to cloud, it's understanding how the different pieces and parts of the cloud infrastructure are put together, the platform is put together, and then the software as a services as an independent plane to figure out what security products that we need to maybe think about selecting and how do we do the resiliency of the critical infrastructure. All of those things come into play. And so uh, off the left, we see that we're talking about recovery, identify, protect, detect, and respond, which is the cybersecurity framework. And then on the right side, we see where the uh, uh, Cloud Security Alliance provides how they think about security, both from a security risk, the presentation, the application, the information, the infrastructure, uh, the technology operations support, and then the business operations. All of this uh, requires the understanding of all three of these perspectives as a unified implementation process to make sure that you don't forget a step or forget a process, which is the, the outcome of, of what we call poor product design. Now, there are many other uh, NIST guidelines that are affecting this. There's a whole brand new series of SP 1500 documents that have been recently released. Uh, they're quite, quite lengthy. I did not include them in this presentation because for the most part, um, they've been released in the last uh, 60 days and uh, they're helping out in droves. And so I haven't had a chance to review them all. But the gist of it is that they're all supposed to be working together to provide a positive security environment. Um, this is an old diagram. You see it was posted in 2009, but it provides what we call the mapping the model to the metal. This is where we take the, the different various trust boundary layers and we start to identify what is actually happening to each one of them. And so, for example, when we talk about the, the infrastructure service facilities trust boundary, we're talking about power, cooling, and space. And if you look off to the right, we'll begin to see what we're talking about uh, physical, which could be plant security, uh, what we call CCTV, which is closed circuit television and guards. And so this is how we physically would protect the facility, not necessarily some of the more innate. Now, you also have what's called soft security. This is where you have swipe access controls and you would have limited exposure, clearly to access rights. All of those come into play, but I use the facility one because it's often easily understood, which is that you're just talking about how much space is in the facility, how much cooling do you need require for it, and how much power does it have. Now, the security control model, as you can see, is inverse laid over to the different various component parts so that we can see what is going on. We see that there is the infrastructure, the platform, and the software as a service modality, which is then transcribed over to the right for the cloud model, and then it is actually mapped, as we'll see. 
And so this is provided as a working model. It's a very powerful working model. It's a semantic ontology. It helps to identify and coalesce the different things that we have to do from a security standpoint in order to begin the modernization of the secure process for a cloud implementation. And so in this world, if we were to look at the compute and storage, which is part of the hardware trust boundary, we can tell you that we're talking about from a security standpoint, host-based firewalls, um, host intrusion detection services, host intrusion protection services, integrity and file log management, and encryption masking. Um, there's more things that you can do there. These are just some of the common things that are normally associated with compute and storage. And as you see over there, you can see where it says compute network and uh, storage. And so that's what the term is. And so this is just to kind of give you a generic understanding of how these things interact with each other. There are much finer grain controlled models than this. This is just to kind of show you the big picture items to make sure that we're all talking the same language and the same modality. Um, for the most part, this model works and has been applied within the Cloud Security Alliance and it was recently adopted by NIST as early as 2014. Uh, it's continued to implement itself throughout the different various SP1800 um, documents. Very important to understand that this is what we call the working starting model, which began the, the serious work for the Cloud Security Alliance, who is an international organization to find standards for cyber for cybersecurity as it applies to cloud. So, um, Again, this slide is uh, publicly available. This is not my slide. I provide it because it's part of the required training on the Cloud Security Alliance in order to make sure that we start from a, a single unified point. Um, this slide is a, a great slide. I use it a lot in my teaching courses at the University of Maryland to define cloud security. So thank you again for this particular slide from uh, Dr. Hoff. It is a great slide and has continued to be updated. I just use this one because it's one of the few ones that shows the model uh, to the security and how those different things are applied. Okay, so what we'll we have here are the top cloud cybersecurity threats. We see data breaches as one of the big top threats. Identity management, uh, insecure FBI, system height of vulnerabilities, account hijacking, malicious insider, advanced persistent threats, data loss, insufficient due diligence, which is called cyber awareness and resiliency. Um, we'll talk more about this later. Abuse and nefarious use of cloud services. This is where people are using cloud not necessarily in the manner that it was intended. Uh, denial of service, shared technology vulnerabilities, spectrum meltdown affected cloud, uh, specifically cybersecurity, and then we have crypto jacking. Now, column one is the threat. If you look to the column in the right, we begin to see some of the major things that are assigned with uh, the different various pieces of parts. Um, we find out that you know, cloud on the cloud attacks is a is a emerging threat. Um, this is where you take the compute power of a given security uh, a product and you apply it towards a, a less secure cloud in order to break into it. Um, it also has a denial of service or distributed, and we also have DNS flooding. Now, the intent here, not necessarily to destroy anything, it's just to deny the service of the cloud to another. Uh, crypto jacking is the one that's just going completely off the rails. Uh, this is a huge problem right now. Um, and Spectrum Meltdown actually applies to the supply chain risk management framework. Um, these are the IBM Intel chips that were originally built inside the United States that were then exported outside the country. And then subjectively, because of the way the chips were designed, certain security flaws were introduced into uh, most of the computer systems. Now, these Spectrum Meltdown affected the Intel core chips, which were found on the majority of the cloud different service providers. To be clear, they're not the only ones that suffer from this particular attack. Um, pretty much anyone that has a non -nine, ninth generation chip is actually affected by this particular problem. Um, so again, these are the top threats. Uh, these were compiled by the Cloud Security Alliance. They're uh, updated uh, every year and they're socialized through the various different uh, discussions that are held annually. Um, and so if, if you're interested in this particular topic, I strongly recommend the Cloud Security Alliance be something that you seek out. Uh, Jim Rivas and the gang over there are very good at uh, helping you define. One of the things I want to talk about, I kind of mentioned it earlier, is insufficient due diligence and cyber awareness and resiliency. Inside the United States, uh, cyber crime is on the rise. Um, for the most part, it, it's a byproduct of um, poor design uh, beginning to find itself into our cybersecurity standardization. What this means is that Security people 
are often overridden by senior management who do not feel like doing what is called proper cybersecurity. Now, in some instances, we have to be fair. Um, cybersecurity is a hard thing to do when you start talking about um, all the different technologies and services, and it requires um, the security engineer to understand every facet of what's going on in order to make the best uh, well-suited decision. And so it's not just because the the program manager doesn't understand the nature of the, of the cyber risk. It's often because the cyber risk is not easily explained and understood. And so cyber awareness and resiliency, very simple concept. You cannot do cybersecurity if you're not aware. And you, if you're not aware of, of different cyber attacks, you can't build the resilience into the system. So these are all independently with each other. And that's called a car. And it's called a car on purpose because when you get in your car, a lot of people don't understand that by the time you put your key in the ignition and you turn it on, all of these awareness and resilience things for your car have already been built. And for the most part, you're not even aware of certain security protections that are put into the vehicle. This could be the design of the way that the engine breaks in, ca in case of a car accident. This is the way that if the uh, engine doesn't turn over, it will flash a warning light, let you know what's going on. Now in cloud, we're getting there, but we're not there all the way yet. And there's always room for improvement. And the good news is that the, the various different cloud service providers are making an earnest attempt to make this work. Um, kudos to all of the different cloud providers on this particular issue, but this is something that is causing a lot of problems. So when you see a lot of the data breaches, it's usually lack of due diligence. Uh, for our UK fans, um, where this is really relevant to you was a, a organization called uh, Code Spaces. Uh, this is a UK-based Amazon service portal, and um, they were hijacked. Uh, and what happened? Someone got into and guess what their root password was on the S3 buckets, and then tried to ransom for their control back of the system. When uh, Code Spaces refused to give the money or pay the ransom, they basically took down the entire um, company. Well, the problem is when that company was taken down, it took down 26 other companies along with it. It was the first time where one company took out 26 other companies simply because they had trusted them to do the right thing. And for the most part, they did. The problem is they failed to implement what's called multi-factor authentication and actually start to break down the different various things that you can do through Amazon. So they had one security password to do everything. And they should have had multiple. Um, this is one of the lessons learned from this particular event. And this has been updated as, again, uh, to show you how strong the Amazon folks are. They have now updated this as a best practice not to do this. They tell you to come up with multiple passwords for specific functions. So with that, we're going to move on to the next slide. These are the top seven uh, infamous data breaches. Um, most of these are all situated with cloud. Um, these are ongoing investigations in some parts, and some of them are actually been done and completed. But some of the big ones are the Microsoft uh, breach that occurred because of the business online suite that was hacked. Um, this was a, a, a whoopsie-daisy. This was actually something that was not supposed to be configurable. Unfortunately, it was something that was allowed to have the configuration changed. Huge problem for Microsoft. They were able to finally fix it in 2012, and it required them to release a lot of information on configuration settings. Um, again, Microsoft is, is, in my personal opinion, has made a dedicated effort to, to document their security flaws and make recommendations as fast as humanly possible. Um, Dropbox, um, again, another perfect example. Significant. Um, uh, issues with this particular breach. Um, it was announced in 2012, uh, but we did not understand the nature of it until 2016. Uh, we now know that the hackers tapped into 60 million user accounts. And if we're following current relevant news, on uh, Thursday of last week, it was announced that potentially 29 billion people had their email addresses and passwords leaked on the dark web. And so this is a perfect example of how this was first announced in 2012. Now, I will say that Dropbox has not been alleged to be involved in this most recent breach. However, this shows you how the hackers are going after user accounts and email addresses and passwords. And the really startling fact is it was five gigabytes of data. And the recent release that was announced in Thursday last week, we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of almost an entire a terabyte, which makes this breach extremely small. And when you think about 29 billion people's user accounts being hacked, so as a nature of being a cybersecurity expert, I strongly recommend that everybody on the phone or listening to this webinar consider going and changing their passwords for all their email accounts, all of their uh, financial institution accounts, just to verify that there was no uh, funny business. Um, 
I also recommend that everybody in your extended family do the same. That way what happens is you reset the passwords and hopefully make it a little bit difficult. Um, I would also say on this particular note, if you want to go back to paper, where you would write down your, your passwords on a piece of paper and you put it in a sealed envelope um, so that you're the only one that knows what the actual password is, and then you want to lock it up in the safe. Um, this is done for several different reasons. Um, I would say never type them up on a computer so they look real nice. Just write them out in long form. That way that the only one knows how to read your own handwriting is you. And again, this is uh, Dropbox is the first indication of it as of Thursday of last week. Uh, there is no indication that Dropbox has been involved in this much recent breach, but multiple um, organizations have been affiliated with this. Um, we're going to get to the elections of Mexico. A pretty interesting thing here. This happened in April 2016. Um, we see that their data voter registration files were compromised. Uh, pretty, pretty significant. We figure it's 93 million voters that were affected, and it had to do with poor configuration of the database. Now. That seems like a, a simple thing, but if we go back up the top to Microsoft, we kind of see where there was a configuration issue yet again. And if you remember a moment ago, I was talking about due diligence. Configuration falls under the cyber awareness and resiliency. If they were aware that there was a poor configuration problem, which it seems that they were not until after the breach, this kind of shows you where they were not aware and they couldn't build the resiliency that they required for the system, or the system was broken into. LinkedIn. Um, I actually use LinkedIn. However, uh, cyber criminals are really uh, excited to get into this thing. Uh, the only thing that they get in more into is Facebook, because uh, Facebook gives them different uh, elements and, and different information sets that they want. But LinkedIn um, has been making some significant changes. They're now beginning to offer multi-factor authentication capabilities, uh, but they were the victim of a 6 million uh, user password attack. Um, this was possible on multiple dark web forums, not just the Russian forum, but this is the one that's been publicly acknowledged in both as in a written format and in publications and in and, and various different um, peer-reviewed articles. The next one is the Home Depot breach. This one was large. This is actually a point of sales. And what, what someone did is they figured out how to get into the POS system because the POS system wasn't properly configured. Um, the Home Depot breach was similar to the same breach that happened to Target. Uh, both of them uh, were different in their, their targeting. One was a POS attack, and the other one was attacked through the um, unsecured um, wireless, I believe it was the thermostat, which allowed for them to get into the POS system. But the exploit was exactly the same in that they attacked the POS in order to get credit card for credit card uh, RAM scraping or skimming. Um, this was a fairly expensive Home Depot. I paid a lot of money in this particular exploit that occurred on them. However, it was very similar to the 2014 attack on Target as well. Um, Apple iCloud, often thought as one of the more secure platforms. However, they did have an issue where it resulted in the breach of several different celebrity uh, private photos being leaked online. Um, there was a misperception that it was done on each of the individual phones. And it was actually found out it was actually the Apple iCloud. So what I tell all of my friends and family on the Apple iCloud, it's just a great thing to have. Um, it's wonderful. But you should treat it just like every other security password system you have. You should change it about every 60 to 90 days. And you should keep track of every one of the passwords you've ever written previously. And that way you can keep track and make sure that none of the passwords are the same. Now, one of the values of having a written password log as you can kind of keep track of how the passwords change and you can make sure that you don't use the same password twice or that you don't follow this particular pattern. And this is very important because sometimes when passwords are sold online, someone tries to use your password generation process in order to figure out or anticipate what kind of passwords you may or may not choose. And the last, of course, one we kind of talked a little bit about it was the Yahoo breach. It was massive, it was large, it continues to cause problems for Yahoo today. and. Uh, I actually have a Yahoo account, and I do change the password every 30 days. And um, my family doesn't use Yahoo anymore because I was such a, um, a security person that asked them to constantly change it. So they've asked me to uh, quit telling them that, so they stopped using it. Um, so here are some real simple ways of understanding uh, Amazon security breach or Amazon security concerns, or as we call it, the National Vulnerability State Space. I'm not here to pick on Amazon. Um, they're the most uh, uh, common understood as a cloud service provider. Um, they have the biggest uh, and or largest amount of adoption currently within the United States. 
And so what I wanted to show you here is that how simple it is to go and figure out how many vulnerabilities are associated. This is what we call by awareness. So if you're going to Amazon, I always preach this in my train courses, you go to the National Vulnerabilities Database, you find out about every one of these, you print them out, you harvest them, you publish them, you get your security team to go through these things with a fine tooth comb, making sure which ones are applicable, which ones are not applicable, and having a mitigation strategy written for it. Now, uh, sometimes it's simple configuration, which is great. And so this is where you put into your security documentation and your security standards of what is acceptable, what's unacceptable. And this helps you design your, your pen testing. This helps you design your security posture. And more importantly, this is how you begin to do your baked in security because you start to see where the different pieces of parts start to interact with each other. So we see that there's one up here for Lenovo Small Assistant Android uh, with different uh, versions that are affected. We see that Open Authority uh, has issues when it goes through various different applications. And then, of course, um, we start to see where the owner's flag, right? So these are all examples of what the security engineer has to think about when they're doing their assessment and how they're doing their assessment model. And buried in this, there's actually supply chain. So you begin to see, well, we don't want to use potentially Androids because it, inter it introduces a security flaw that we don't want to deal with or we don't have the money to deal with. And so you start to make wise decisions, and this is how you make cyber awareness and resiliency a real thing. So Amazon is a product and it's a service, and then you have to build everything on top of it. And so you have to understand how all that works together in order to make sure that you make the wise, most appropriate decision. Um, I could go into each one of these things in detail. I will not. I will just simply say I strongly recommend that you add this to your process for determination. In order for us to begin to understand what a trust boundary is, this is actually a great diagram that was provided to NIST. Um, Dr. Agoria, Michaela Agoria, this is one of the diagrams that she was helping to develop. But we start to see how two organizations actually share the same cloud environment. And you have a trust aspect between the different non-persons and persons. You have an organizational dynamic network break and you have a dynamic compute resource break. So what this shows is that on the left, you can have company X and company Y both sharing the same infrastructure service inside whatever is the cloud service provider, but they have to agree, if you will, to what things are going to be facilitated and allowed and have those service level agreements negotiated so that they can establish what's called a dynamic logical network perimeter or trust boundary between the two solutions. Um, this is a very complex, this is just to kind of show you where the, the science is. Um, we see that there's overlasting trust boundaries. We have both physical and non-physical entities. Um, we see that we also have um, what we call business process Y and business process X. And these are all designed to show you the differences between the two systems, uh, but to show you where they actually come together, which is right there at that network level. And so that's what we call the network trust boundary. So you would have to have about 13 trust boundaries. This shows you how to draw each one of the different various trust boundaries and to identify the shared resources and the shared technology threat that affects both of the organization and is the role of both the organizations working with the cloud service provider to make sure that their systems are as secure as humanly possible. Again, this is a very elongated discussion. I could probably spend the rest of our time talking about this diagram. What I really want to do is introduce the concept of how a trust boundary is created and crafted, and more importantly, to show a working model of the, of the different conceptual ideas that go into it. Um, there's always room for improvement. This is one of the diagrams I think is best well suited. Um, this is out of Thomas Earle's book on the core computing uh, concepts. Great book, great diagram, and uh, we thank him for his authorization for use. Now, we take that diagram that I was just showing you, and we begin to build this right here. So on the left-hand side, we see what's called the Inheritable Cloud Security Model Dynamic Boundary Set. And it shows an overlay to the cloud security lines. Now, if you remember, I talked about the cloud security lines before. This shows taking the security trust boundaries from the cloud security lines and rolling them into sequence buckets. Now, if you take a look on the right-hand side, we start to lay out how those things look inside a trust boundary. So you have security risk management information technology and the business operations supports which show up on the left-hand side. And then in the deployment boundary, we actually break that down to show you what's going on. So the deployment boundary takes to an ecosystem boundary, and then you have the infrastructure, which is facility, hardware, abstraction, core connectivity, API boundary. 
platform, which is your integration and middleware trust boundary, and then your soft, uh, software as a service boundary. Well, we have user protection, application software, and presentation boundaries. Now, each one of those boundaries requires its own SSP, its own SLA agreement. And by doing these things, you actually begin to identify where your security risk threats may or may not be, depending on the nature of what you're trying to solve. But the two diagrams show you at the high level of how things work, and then it shows you the deployment boundaries. So you can physically, inside the infrastructure as a service, have an on-premise. You would have different deployment models that are being done. We're showing you a simple deployment model. But if you look up there with this cloud deployment model, you could put all four of them in there and come up with the same risk architecture in order to mitigate it. Now, um, this has been used successfully um, on multiple different activities. Um, it helps to realign and creates a logical model for figuring this out. And if uh, you were paying attention previously, this follows the frogs diagram that was showed early in this presentation in case you want to go look back. And it does break down all these different pieces and parts so that we understand it. Again, this was a uh, relational diagram between the Cloud Security Alliance and this organization and myself. Uh, this diagram has been utilized several different times to find out functional alignment. We're gonna change a little bit. We're gonna start talking about that supply chain risk. What I wanna do is to kind of show you, this comes from the University of Tennessee, and this shows you how difficult cybersecurity has now become. It shows how warfare and terrorism and conflict and escalation are on one side, awareness, information, and communication and commerce are part of providers, and then you have the users, which are social, commerce, news, political, health, and entertainment, but yet they all share the same conceptual area where they have topics that span both sides of the discussion. The reason why I show this is that there's a perspective here. You have a user's perspective and a provider's perspective. We also have to understand who is responsible for what, when, and how, and this is some of the ways that we do it. This diagram is to show you that sometimes you could be talking about cyber warfare without realizing that you're talking about systems technology and management. You could talk about leadership, and sometimes you're actually talking about conflict theory. You could talk about risk, and sometimes you're talking about regulations, and you could be talking about system of system. So this diagram is, is uh, very complex. However, it actually shows you the complexity problem that makes cyber awareness and resiliency such an issue. And that is you have to understand the majority of the things on this in order to uh, begin to make wise decisions about your security posture. As promised, here's the supply chain risk management. We just wanted to show you one. I wanted to, to get to the heart of the discussion. And we see that uh, this has now been part of the new uh, cyber security um, framework. Uh, this was released in April of 2018. This was one of the first things that was included, and there is actually a supply chain risk management security control baseline that was developed and generated. There are basically six um, specific uh, subcategories in the cyber supply chain risk management as it applies to the cybersecurity framework, and this is for critical infrastructure protection. Now, as you see, we talk about how the priorities are done, the constraints, the risk tolerance. This all applies to cyber awareness and resiliency. These are interdependently related with each other, and they help us make the wise decisions that we need to make. We have a, a definition statement. We find out that COVID has gotten themselves involved. The ISO has been mapped out. And then we see that NIST has indicated that SA9, SA12, and PM9 were also selected. Now, if you go through the cyber supply chain risk management, there's a separate document from NIST. The one that we used was just to supply uh, the cyber security framework. And what happens is by putting those together, we distill it down and we find out here's actual, what we call the supply chain cyber vetting security controls as defined by NIST. Um, and we call this at tier one. These controls uh, uh, mutate, if you will, as you begin to have higher security risk, uh, where you can start adding additional security controls to make sure that you vet it appropriately. But these are the basic security controls that are common so we find out that part of the cyber vetting is your risk management strategy. Uh, that's PM9, if you remember from just a second ago, it was just on the screen, that in order to achieve the first objective, you have to be able to properly identify your risk management strategy for cyber vetting. Um, we have to understand how you do your supply chain protection. What is part of your criticality analysis? Where do you get your security categorization? How did you do your risk assessment? And so on and so forth. The real takeaway here is that these are the bare minimum security controls in order to reach what's called tier one, 
which is that you are actually implementing a element of it. For several people inside the United States government, these controls are not optional. However, for some that are, the DOD is now starting to make these controls mandated in order to be a supply manager um, to them. They've had some issues in the past, and this is some of the things they're doing to fix it. Congratulations to Dr. Ron Ross and his team for coming up with this conceptual idea. A lot of hard work on their part. So we're going to wrap up because I'm getting ready to get into the question phase, which I'm sure you guys are all interested in asking. So here are the key takeaways. Cloud security looks hard, but it's not. Understand the terms and the definitions. It will help you understand more complex ideas. I always say that if you start out by understanding what it's being spoken about, how it's being spoken about, it makes it a whole lot easier to understand in the big scheme of things. Make sure you understand the differences between the supply chain risk management and the security architecture that you've selected for your particular implementation. Although it doesn't seem like they are independent with each other, they are very much depending on itself. Um, understand the differences between the starting point of the security control baselines from each different products. Uh, Amazon has its own security control baseline, Google does, and so does Microsoft Azure. And each one of them have a unique approach to the way that they're trying to solve for cybersecurity and be aware of what those differences are because they can also help you make decisions. It can't just be a cost. Uh, for instance, you can go with the cheapest, most uh, available cost uh, prohibitive solution and if I have to spend a lot more money on the security. And that has been some things that I've seen. Understand, and, and I can't stress this now, understand the complete cloud vulnerability based with the provider that you're thinking about and make sure that you understand how to do baked in security concepts at every conceivable level um, the model that I wrote was published in the U.S. Cybersecurity Magazine. It is publicly available for, for, for use. Um, please do so. Uh, it helps you. And in certain questions, it will help you understand where your logical trust boundary is. And it will also help you define where you need to start doing a little bit extra work should you find something that doesn't meet your needs. Uh, for all my security engineers, remember our primary role is to say no. And this is how you can say no by saying that this, this crosses a trust boundary. Understand how to build a cyber threat framework. Uh, understand what the mitigation strategies are for each one of the different threats. Understand that you need to do uh, threat uh, event linking. How can one threat implement another threat, implement another threat, and what's the mitigation strategy? Uh, this is often one of the key things that is misunderstood inside cloud, and this is where we find a lot of the issues. Can't stress enough to you that when you do start select security products, find yourself a, a proper security range, a, a cyber one, where you can test out your cloud architecture. You want to be able to train your staff. You want to stress them. You want to do regression testing. You want to expose the user behaviors, and you want to make sure that your system is resistant to social engineering. Uh, it's not as simple as it sounds. It's much more involved. Um, we are finding that we can do a lot more testing and evaluation on a cybersecurity range than on the actual system. And we can throw a lot more scenarios at the cloud security engineers in order to start to teach them certain uh, failure points that are not often understood. Um, understand cyber awareness and resiliency. This is an entire white paper I wrote with a good friend of mine, Mr. Aaron Bishop, the former Chief Information Security Officer from SCIC. And it's how we were trying to define how these things are independently related to each other. Um, you can't do one uh, and then not affect the other two. And so we used to call this confidentiality, integrity, and availability. There's been so much change in security, we, we went to this direction. Uh, you need to be able to design a system that can have a mass uh, casualty event happen to it and still be able to recover the system and be able to use it. Understand how to build a, a cloud boundary assessment system security plan. Uh, very difficult to do. You have to understand each of the trust boundaries, each of the security controls associated with it, the security control plan for each one of the services that runs in it and how it supports and or implements. Because what happens is you're actually going into a cloud and you're saying, I want this service, this service, this service, and this service. And so when you put those services together, you actually create your security plan. So make sure you understand that very well. And then of course, as I've talked about several times, your cloud trust boundaries. And more importantly, make sure you know how to define your organizational trust boundaries. Understand its vendors and its mission partners. Now vendors actually apply to the supply chain risk management. They also apply to the cybersecurity framework. You have to understand those interdependencies to make sure that when you select a vendor, whether it be Amazon, Google, or Azure, that those are all properly being vetted and you understand all the security risks associated with it. Um, I always like to make sure that everybody understands where I get this. 
So nothing that I've told you today, you cannot go and find on the internet. It's made publicly available to you. And of course, it helps when you can see these different things. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, what I like to do is go put my last slide up. Um, I'm a little bit of a, of, a, of a nerd. I do have a lot of things that I do. I'm very excited about my work. I do consider cybersecurity to be a career. I've been working on it for a very long time. I look forward to any of the questions